Hello and welcome to After Scientology, Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I get together and discuss the events in the world of Scientology as reported by Tony. Hey, welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Big week, big week. Big week. Yeah, a little bit of a celebrity week this week. We got a few things to talk about with some celebrity connections. That, But first, there was the return of... Uh, Another event that had sort of been sidelined in the Scientology world that came back. What was this uh, first article about? Yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on on what what it was like in in your time. Um, I it, it to me it looks like this year, beginning with uh, last November, David Miscavige has been trying to return things to some sort of normality after the pandemic. So last November they returned the IAS gala to St. Hill. In December, they returned the New Year's Eve thing to Shrine Auditorium in L.A. In March, they returned the LRH birthday party to Ruth Eckert Hall. I still have not heard anything about Maiden Voyage, but the other, not quite as big on the calendar as those, but another, like the next tier, was Auditor's Day in September. And I haven't seen anything about an Auditor's Day for years. And then not only did they return it this year, but... I started seeing postings and photos that they kind of made a big deal about it in in numerous orgs around the world. So that feels again like Miscavige trying. Okay, let's get the troops, to, you know, back to what we used to do. And uh, we got some photos from Flag where they had a pretty big turnout of folks, and you know the typical thing where they they have ice sculptures and stuff and. Um, and then the the symbol of the auditors is the lion. So the lion was everywhere. I, I don't know. That doesn't mean a whole lot to me. What what did Auditor's Day mean to you when you were in the Sea Org? Was it much of a thing? Well, it's actually died off after a while and became almost non-existent. Um, and that was Miscavige de-emphasizing it because okay. it, it, it very much in the 80s and 90s, the early 90s at least, Auditor's Day was a big event. It wasn't a second tier event. It was a top tier event. Oh, wow. And it was, yeah, it actually had that status. And Auditor's Day was a big, big deal. In fact, they were named Auditors of the Year. They flew them in from around the world to award them. And being an auditor used to be the status button in Scientology. It wasn't IAS donations or ideal org donations or money money based. It was how many hours were you audit team? And yeah. that was something people held as a metric, as a status. Scientology is so different from that now that this actually is very interesting. I don't know if this is a bellwether of future things, but it's if it is, then it is a return to a return of older days. And that could mean something uh, in terms of future releases or direction, but we'll have to wait and see what, what Ms. Gavage is really doing with this, or is it just another excuse to bring Scientologists bodies back into the, to the shop, because that's what they really need to do what they do in Scientology. So could be just that too. Right. Well, let me tell you about an email I got after the post came out, because I had made a little joke about how, you know, no matter how bad things are in Scientology, Dave is still forking out for ice sculptures uh, for the Otter's Day. And I got an email from somebody who said, hey, Dave doesn't pay for those. You know, that was definitely something that the local org had to raise money for. And if we paid for ice sculptures, it meant that maybe people didn't get paid for the next couple of weeks. And so I thought, what another great example of how things actually work in Scientology, you know. So I'm glad that person pointed that out to me. And I will not be assuming that Dave is paying for the next time. <laughs> no, that's a good point. In fact, let me just say, I mean, maybe this builds on that is, you know, that New Year's event at the Shrine Auditorium. It's the PAC orgs that pay for that. They don't, that money doesn't come down from international management for any of that. We had to pay. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, SOP for Scientology. I got you. There was another little bit in that story, by the way, because sometimes you'll post a couple different things in the article. Yeah. And there was a Puerto Rican, there was a Puerto Rico ideal org communication that went out about, right. you know, how woo, la, la, they're going for Puerto Rico. But I had to laugh that there were three little bullet points of why would Puerto Rico be an important place to build an ideal org? And the fact that Puerto Rico is a tax haven was one of those points. 
I know, and I, I, I puzzled over that because all of the United States is a tax haven for Church of Scientology. So I'm not sure why they're making a special uh, thing about Puerto Rico, which, of course, is part of the United States. But uh, yeah, I, that stuck out to me too, and I and I I, I don't know that they're, they're 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 saying what they can to promote themselves because they want to be the next ideal org to get done. Very much so, very much so. I just thought it was funny because I was thinking, you know, if you were trying to build a synagogue, <laughs> if you were trying to build a, you know a mosque in Puerto Rico, would you be advertising? Well, one of the reasons you should donate is because we got a tax. You know, it's just so they're so money focused. Yeah. So money focused. I think that's what really stood out for me. Right. Um, now, this was a little sad. There was a, a memoriam article on a person who yeah. had contributed in the past to our knowledge of Scientology. What was this one? Right. I I, uh, I learned, I, I confirmed with his brother that Joe Reich uh, passed away while he was on a business trip in London a couple of weeks ago. He was only 66. Uh, really, uh, you know, great uh, former contributor. I, he was. I, I got to do some great stories with him. Always fun. We communicated behind the scenes a lot. He's just a great guy. Joe is a Lebanese Australian who was a pro rugby player in Australia in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, and uh, discovered Scientology along with uh, other rugby players. Steve Kinane has a whole chapter in his book Fair Game about how Scientology really targeted Australian sports at that time. And people like Chris Guider and Joe Reich were caught up on, caught up in it. And Joe ended up going to the flag land base in, I think, 82. And that's where he met the Masterson family. And at that point, Carol was still married to Peter. But they split up uh, not too long after that. And so Joe Reich and Carol Masterson got married in 1985. And Joe Reich became Danny Masterson's stepdad. Uh, and then Joe and Carol had two kids of their own, Jordan and Alana, who were born Jordan and Alana Reich, by the way. Um, and all four kids uh, eventually got into modeling and acting. But Joe, uh, Joe and Carol split up in, I believe it was 95, so about, about 10 years of marriage. And then then um, but he stayed in their lives. He was still he's we've written stories about this, how close he was to Danny and Christopher um, and his and his kids during those 10 years. But then in 2005, he got uh, a committee of evidence and got tossed out of Scientology. I think they accused him of squirreling or something, Chris. And I, I don't know if we want to go into all that detail, but but basically whatever it was, Joe Reich got, uh, you know, crosswise with the church. He was declared. And instantly, all four of his kids just turned their backs on him. And he had never heard one other word from them. And uh, Jordan and Alana even changed their names to Masterson. And they today, you know, Jordan, uh, Alana was on Walking Dead. And Jordan was in a Tim Allen series, I think. And they're, they're Alana Masterson, Jordan Masterson. Mm -hmm. So really devastating for Joe. And But he 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 uh, came out in, uh, in Australia in 2010 as an ex-Scientologist and spoke out about Scientology and a big national uh, television thing there. Really important show there. And and he's been talking since then. And then he was very helpful to me about the Masterson family and, and their background. It was very helpful during the trials, during Danny Masterson's trials. So like I said, he's just been, as Steve Kinane said in the piece I wrote, just a brave, he was a brave athlete and he's a brave whistleblower against Scientology. And his brother, what his brother Anthony Reich told me was that to the very end, he was always hoping to be reunited with his kids and would have welcomed them back in a minute. And uh, just very heartbreaking that he never had that opportunity. And uh, now he's gone. So just really sad. Very sad, very much indeed. And we can understand Mas Danny Masterson, 2005, the disconnection happens. Joe gets into all this ethics trouble with the church and gets the boot. Well, Masterson was already under in cahoots with the church. They were already protecting him. That whole thing had all those wheels were already turning, but you look at the other kids and you're like, you know, it, it's just, it shows the cult is the cult. It's a cult. It's not just a religion. It's not just some nice little thing, you know, and this is what exactly what they do is they break up families like this. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, other Scientology celebrities and family, 
Emily Armstrong uh, and Emily Armstrong's mom, Gail. Uh, you wrote an article about this based off of uh, news from Mitch Brisker, yeah? Yeah, so last week you and I had been talking about how this story, this controversy has been going that Lincoln Park decided to reunite after seven years after the death of singer Chester Bennington, and um, they brought in Emily Armstrong, who's a Scientologist, whose mother is a Sea Org member. And last week uh, had a great story about that Mike Rinder had literally been in the hole with Gail Armstrong uh, and in base. And then after he had left, Gail Armstrong took part in the smear campaign of him. So, you know, Emily Armstrong's mom is very, very hardcore, formerly very high level work directly with David Miscavige. Mark Headley followed that up with some uh, a video talking about some actual documents associated with her, some speeches she wrote, briefings about OSA, just really amazing stuff. But what was missing from all that, Chris, was I I still didn't have a good grip on what her relationship was like with her daughter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the fact that Emily Armstrong's mom was this hardcore Sea Org member and that she took part in a smear campaign, that's not great. But what if they don't have much of a relationship? I don't know. Well, Mitch Brisker reached out to me and said that, you know, and the other thing was, this was all information that was kind of old. Um, Mitch Brisker reached out to me and said he had been working with Gail as recently as 2020. And that's one of the great things about Mitch. He's he's just so recently out of Scientology. Yeah. So we did a little email exchange, and he explained to me that um, uh, that, he, that Gail and her daughter were close and that... Um, he, he said she never discussed about whether Emily or not was a Scientologist or not because it was assumed. And I think, you know, with a Sea Org mom, it, 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 definitely if she's very involved in her daughter's life, her daughter's a Scientologist. And then there was this one memory that I think is so significant. In 2019, he distinctly remembers Gail getting dressed up with a very nice leather jacket to leave it base to go to L.A. to see Emily. And... um uh, Mitch said the implication was clear. She was going to see Emily perform. So that's that's really, I think, a significant thing um, that they are apparently tight and involved in each other's lives. And as far as Mitch is, uh, as far as he knows, Gail's still a Sea Org member and Emily's still a Scientologist. So because you're seeing, still seeing stories coming up about this whole controversy and of course, newspapers are being very cautious and saying that that Emily Armstrong is is tied to Scientology or she's associated with Scientology. It's like, no, she's a Scientologist and her mom is a hardcore Sea Org member. I mean, this is pretty well established. But I just but the other thing that Mitch said, I thought this was interesting. And I it, keep in mind that Mitch himself just recently came out of Scientology and he was promoting the church with films and that kind of thing. He's sympathetic uh, to Gail and Emily's situation and points out that it can be very difficult to have a relationship in that situation. And so he um, he argues for some empathy about them. I think some other people are still – I think I do understand, however, the, the real uh, uh, problems people have with the way this came together. Uh, Chester Bennington's mother this week was complaining that none of, nobody in the band informed her that the band was going to be getting back together, and they had, they had told her that they would. Just some really odd things about how things have gone down. But I, I'm also seeing reporting that the band's doing great and they've got a hit, uh, a new hit and everything. So I don't know. I just I would just thank Mitch Brisker for reaching out to me uh, to give us some of that that more fresh intel about them. Absolutely. It's a difficult situation. We've commented before about, you know, navigating this. I, I did have some additional thoughts about it I'd like to share as well, you know, having watched and consumed this and thinking about it as a second generation Scientologist myself, having been in the Sea Org and knowing, you know, everything I know about the ups and downs of of life at, at the Int base. It, so we know a, f a few things here. We know that Gail Armstrong was in the hole. But that means she was a high level international executive because that's the only people who were there. And that she was in Miscavige's bad graces for a period of time, just like all the other people who were in there. Right. And she had to contribute to the Lord of the Flies situation in there because everybody was part of that. But at some point she got out and she's not part of what Mitch has described as the as the data, you know, entry people. She's, you know, somehow got the okay to go off the base and go see her daughter. That's huge. 
That's not just a, that's a whole survivor who has now regained enough trust that she's allowed to go off and do this. So that it means that she's, I don't see how it's possible that she's not, that she's, that she's not back in Miscavige's good graces if she's being allowed to do that. Because I know from personal experience of seeing people that when you're in his bad graces, you're put places where you don't get to go out and where nobody sees you, like the cat galley and things like that, uh, or Australia. So um, so she hasn't gotten that uh, done to her. Um, we also know that Emily didn't say a word about Scientology in her press statement about, you know, regrets about going to Danny Masterson's trial, which does speak volumes, the, the absence of that. So, so, yes, we have to assume she's a Scientologist. And we have to assume that they're both practicing Scientologists, which means they're up to the abuse because that's what being in Scientology is. So I'm all about, you know, understanding and giving um, passes to ex cult members who come out as second gen or first gen or whatever and seeing the error of their ways, taking responsibility, moving forward. But I do have a little bit of judgment still about Gail here <laughs> and about Emily and her ongoing relationship with somebody who is in David Miscavige's, you know, good graces or, you know, possibly even higher. So I, I'd like a lot more information, of course, but in terms of how to think about this, it ain't easy. It's not easy. You yeah, know? no, I, I think you I think you've sussed that out really well. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought I'd break it down for people as I see it. So without trying to lay a bunch of opinions or judgment on it, it's just it's hard. Um, now, something that's not hard to judge, though, another article came out this week. This is the one. This is the fun stuff is OT phenomenon. What did we get this week? Because something changed, didn't it? <laughs> well, you know, they've gotten so tepid. They've gotten so dull. Uh, I, I have in a collection of old advanced magazines from the 70s, and OT phenomena were so wild then. People were talking about how they were leaving their bodies and going across state lines to help out, you know, with the surgery, or they were encountering, you know, what what other people would call ghosts, and they would say it was, a, I encountered a Phaeton at the cemetery, and I talked to them. I mean, just wild stuff and then my favorite though are the the people that you know use their tractor beams to prevent a car accident happening in front of them stuff like that just you know superhuman godlike stuff that people yeah. supposedly would get at the ot levels and of course the whole point is you publish those stories without any fact checking or anything in this magazine because then the people that are not ot read that, salivate over it, and they're like, I need that, I've got it. And that's the whole point, to get people to stay on the bridge, keep going, because eventually you'll get these superpowers too. Well, in recent, more recent years, they had just gotten so, uh, you know, they just seem like little coincidences. I, I got to this, I got to the intersection and the light turned green right then. Wow, that's my OT power. I mean, stuff that happens to you and me all the time. And right. you know, it, so it was just, I, I mentioned that last, last time and then this new issue came out and my tipster said maybe they're listening to you tony because they they got a little more interesting this time not that much but a little more interesting in particular a guy this person needs mental help let me tell you chris because the first thing they said is how much they hate birds i mean who hates birds <laughs> he, you know he hates the noise they make and they keep him up and he hates and but then he realized with his ot powers he could begin to communicate with them and ask them to shut up. And they did. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> so this is like Scientology's version of Dr. Doolittle, right? Except he's a complete jerk. I just thought it was amazing. But uh, so that's that's how they're tr trying to sell these OT levels that, of course, cost tens of thousands of dollars each. As you, you too can tell birds to, you know, get off. I grew up on that stuff. I, well, I, I tell you, it's it's always so popular. I get so many comments. People love OT phenomena. So I, uh, every month, I can't it, wait yeah. to see what they come up with. Well, yeah. No, it was funny because actually, you pointed you you uh, are relating the one with the tractor beams in the car. I remember that one. <laughs> oh, there were I remember there were numerous ones. I saw yeah. a car accident. a car accident was about to happen, and so I got my tractor beams out and I moved the car. I I remember several like that back in the eighties and stuff. They were great. 
Yeah, people were not uh, backed off back then, uh, 70s, 80s, from claiming responsibility for really kind of big, like stuff that you'd be like, wow, you did what kind of stuff, you know? Um, Okay. Uh, Now, another celebrity article, Madrid Org, Tom Cruise. What's the update on this? Yeah, I just happened to see, I, I, you know, Scientology puts out between one and three or four press releases every single day from around the world. Okay. Every day? Really? Every day. Every day there's something about, you know, they've cleaned up a street in South Africa. They've, you know, had a seminar about psychiatry in Seattle, whatever. Every day. And they're, of course, they're eminently ignorable. I mean, they're just, there's nothing, they're, they're just like fluff nonsense. Um, but this this one caught my eye because it was saying 20th anniversary since the Madrid opening. And of course, the Madrid opening is so unique uh, because of the 69 grand openings David Miscavige has presided over since 2003, when this whole ideal org obsession of his began. Tom Cruise has only attended one out of those 69 ideal orgs all over the world. One in September 2004 in Madrid, Spain. It's been pointed out that he and Penelope Cruz had just broken up and maybe that they, he was planning to be there with her and then he couldn't get out of it. I don't know why he decided to be there, but that's such an incredibly important time between Tom Cruise and Scientology, because remember, he had broken up with Nicole in 2000, and he had been kind of out of Scientology for a while, so that they worked really hard to get him spun up. So by 2003, 2004, he was the most gung-ho Scientologist in the world, and Miscavige wanted to use him. And so here he came to this ideal org in Madrid, and, and, you know, David Miscavige gave his speech, but they got Tom Cruise up to give a speech, and he gave it in Spanish. Mm. Uh, thanks to Tiziana Lugli, we have a copy of that. I published it for the first time years ago. Um, but it was interesting to me that this, uh, so, so you know, it's 20 years later, you're going to put out a press release about how great the Madrid Org is. Of course, you'd mentioned that Tom Cruise was there, right? But they didn't. And I thought that was really interesting that the press release left out Tom Cruise altogether. So I thought I'd remind people of that, and I loved an excuse to put that video of him speaking Spanish again. But the other thing that happened that day um, was that after he gives his speech in Spanish, in the video, he bounds down, you know, Tom Cruise, ah, running around, jumps down to the front row of, of seats that have been set up in the street, hands his you know, notes, his binder or whatever, to Tommy Davis, shakes David Miscavige's hand. And who's standing next to David Miscavige? Shelly Miscavige. There it is. And it's the last time, it's the last footage I've ever found of her ever. That was September 2004. A year later, in late August or early September 2005, she was disappeared. And we think she's been held in this little comp- mountain compound in the mountains ab- above Los Angeles ever since. But that's the last time you can see her in any footage at all. And I think maybe Dave doesn't want to remind people of that. So that's why they're not mentioning that Tom Cruise was there. Um, the other thing that's interesting about that Madrid, it's it's such an interesting nexus. Because, again, Tom Cruise is getting spun up. But he's broken up with Penelope Cruise. And reportedly, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not. So reportedly, Tom Cruise complained to Dave at that event about having a difficult time finding a new girlfriend. Whether or not that happened, we do know that right after that event, Dave assigned his wife, Shelly, to do something about it. And that's when those auditions were held that Maureen Orth wrote about so well in Vanity Fair magazine between October, November. They lined up all these auditions for actresses. And that's how they selected Nazanin Boniati to become his girlfriend in November. And Nazanin and Tom dated between November 2005 and January, I'm sorry, four, I'm sorry, November 2004 and January 2005. So about three months, uh, they were seeing each other. 
So all of this stuff comes back to that day in Madrid, Spain, 20 years ago. And yeah, it's kind of funny that Scientology doesn't want to remind people that Tom was there because it's the only one he's been to. So I just had fun pointing that out. Absolutely. I think all of that is spot on. And I and adds never really nothing more to say to it. It's just Scientology is a small world. And uh, man, that that, you know, reminding people that Scientology not only covers up for Masterson and and impedes, you know, felony investigations, it also tries to arrange the romantic love life of its top star. Like this is what we mean by totalist groups. They complete. They 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 total. They cover everything. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's just crazy. It's absolutely yeah. nuts. Yeah. Okay. Now this last one um, was not only um, underground bunker, Daily Beast, uh, yeah. Isaac Hayes. What, yeah. what it's just dropped? What do we got? Right. Here? So I um I got a hold of a document, a really interesting document that was dated November 17th, 2005. That's the day after the infamous trapped in the closet episode of South Park that everybody remembers, where they made fun of Scientology and they actually had a segment where they showed Xenu and it flashed on the screen. This is what Scientologists actually believe. Very famous, very famous episode. And uh Isaac Hayes, his character Chef, was not in that episode. And that was, like I said, November 2005. In March 2006, four months later, Isaac Hayes quit. And, you know, this had been a huge thing for him. Uh, you know, he, they, the, the South Park started, I think, in 1997, I believe. And, you know, they had offered him this role as this school, you know, chef and it, and it had been huge it, it it brought him fame to a whole new you know audience and young people super you know popular and how can he just walk away from that at the time when he walked away he said something about trey parker and matt stone making fun of religions he did not say scientology in particular but they all kind of assumed it had something to do with scientology well um this document said written by Mike Rinder, and I can and I very authenticated it with him. This was a report Mike wrote to David Miscavige the day after that episode aired, how upset they were, and they had briefed Isaac about it, how upset he was. And it says right there in a the document, Isaac is going to leave the show, but we're going to wait some time so it doesn't create a media incident. So, I mean, there it is, the smoking gun. People have always wondered, was he forced out? Was it about that show? Now we have proof positive, absolutely, Scientology. Um, you know, it, and it's unclear how much it came from Isaac and how much it came from Scientology, but whatever. Between the two of them, they decided he's leaving, but they're going to wait a little bit to kind of camouflage it. And that's what happened. He waited till March, then he left, and people were all wondering, well, what was it about? And that's kind of what they intended to do. So it's just it's just really satisfying to kind of have that down in black and white to show what really happened behind the scenes. And the other thing was that Mike in his report to Rinder, I mean, I'm sorry, Mike in his report to David Miscavige was all about blaming Mark Ebner for everything, which is so funny to me because, you know, Mark's a big part of the underground bunker. I, I, I've been friends with him for a long time. He wrote this fantastic uh, expose of Scientology in 1996 in Spy Magazine, where he had actually joined Scientology for a couple of weeks to get a sense of what it was like. What a great piece. And so um, Parker and Stone, when they were going to, they wanted to do an episode about Scientology, they invited him down and just talk to him about it. Tell us about, you know, making that uh, magazine story and what you went through. And he described what he knew about Scientology and the whole Xenu stuff. They were all making the notes and then they made, went and made the episode. And so um, Mike Rinder in the, in the memo is all about what a bigot Mark Ebner is and we're going to go after him. And they did. I mean, they, they had fair game campaigns against him and were investigating him and digging things up on him. So it's just it's just fun to have the actual memo uh, spelling that out, and I, I think uh, you know, uh, and and making some accusations against Mark that are they're garbage. I mean, he 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 is you know one of the things it says in there is that we're going to go after him so hard that 
Central uh, Comedy Central will never use him again. But he said that they did use him again, and that uh, Parker and Stone invited him to holiday parties for years. So uh, Isaac Hayes might have tried to get Ebner in trouble with the network, but it didn't happen. How interesting to see that behind the scenes of how they pull the strings and try to go after. And this is back years ago when they had more power. They had, you know, more juice, as they say. They, um, yeah, that's, there was a, there's just to put this out there, just because I heard this myself years ago, and in case anybody else did too, right, that maybe Isaac didn't want to leave South Park, but was strong armed into it by the church. That could still be true, but the end result is the same and, again, indicates how much push and influence Scientology had with him. Whether he would, went on, whether he wanted to leave or not, he left. And, and as Rinder lays out here, he's obviously, um, you know, uh, didn't feel any need to report to Miscavige. Well, he didn't want to leave, but we're going to have it. I mean, I could see why Mike would not even put that in a report. Right, right. You know, so... That's just, maybe it's rumor, maybe it's not, but it doesn't contradict any of this. And I just wanted right. to point out. I mean, if you just you read know. the memo straight as as the way it's written, you would never assume that Isaac Hayes was reluctant in the least. Right. He was outraged when they told him about it. And yeah, he's he's going to quit, And but we're going to wait to throw people off. And that's just, exactly. that's just the way it says it, so... And as, as having, I'll, I'll only bring that up because when I was in the church... I wrote the same kind of reports on a much lesser scale about handling people and you don't report to your senior all the bullshit they say. You just go, oh, yeah, he's totally with the program. It just is a point. So, okay, that's our show for this week. Tony, thank you very much for breaking all this down. What do we have as any kind of preview for this new week? Oh, boy. I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, the thing that's building, and uh, it'll be looking. I would encourage people to keep an eye out in the media. Is that uh, Rebecca Minkoff and the Real Housewives of New York? Um, that season kicks off a week from now. So uh, you know, with David, all these accusations against David Minkoff that we've been talking about, um, that's going to be interesting to see how that maybe shakes out this week. That okay. will be interesting. That will be. Okay, good. All right, folks. So uh, check out Tony's uh, Substack. The address is right there on the screen in front of you. And we come back in and check with us for the weekly breakdown and summary. So see you next week. Bye-bye.